Welcome back, it's Lucy and Ellie from Rome and Found and we have some very exciting news, the harvest has begun. We've been really excited waiting for this crop to come out because this is a Roman spot that we actually haven't been able to explore very well. We've only had a go in here as extreme rookies, but a lot later research revealed rich Roman activity across the whole site and this is the first time it's not been under crop for over a year. So let's get into it and see what comes up. We knew the forecast wasn't great but we weren't expecting to have to wait half an hour sheltering the car for a torrential downpour to pass upon arrival. But there's no turning back now, the Roman field we've been waiting for for over a year has been freshly harvested so in between the downpours we hike it down to the spot. As the harvest is so fresh we're going to have to brave the stubble and it's possibly the worst stubble of all, rapeseed. Rapeseed leaves behind it thick tree-like stalks that are an utter menace to the coral, making it hard to get close to the ground or even sweep the ground properly as you have to weave between these forests. To make things even worse, the coil fastenings have seized around the logs, so we were unable to switch onto our nifty small coil. So stuck with a rainy day and a difficult dig, it's time to find some Roman. Pray for our knees. First signal on the stubble. Yeah, it does sound good. It's either going to be trash or something decent. Oh, there we go. Look at that. That's a little Roman look. Is it? That's a little Roman. First signal in the stubble. That's definitely a little Roman. Oh, little face on him there. Oh, is There's that? something on him. Oh, no, look, that's... Do you oh, see yeah. all that detail on Oh, there? wow. Look at that. Who's that? First coin in the stubble and it's a beautiful Roman coin of the Feltemp Reparatio type. This type shows a Roman soldier spearing a barbarian horseman. There's lots of varieties to this type showing the barbarian in different poses but in all of them he's dying. Of all the Roman coins that show a battle scene, this one is the most unusual, actually showing a moment of death. It's certainly a strong contender for the most violent and gruesome Roman coin they ever minted. But rather bizarrely, the reverse legend itself means restoration of happy times. So which Roman emperor would have commissioned such a violent coin? Well, the cheeky little face staring up at us is actually that of Constantius II, and these coins were issued from 348 to 361 AD. And if you look into Constantius's life, you can see why he favoured such violent iconography. At the age of just seven, he was declared Caesar by his father, Constantine the Great. And then at the age of 19, his father threw him into his first test, straight into battle, pushing back the invading Persians. Then, when his father died in 337, he ascended to the throne alongside his brothers, Constantine II and Constance. The three emperors were expected to share the empire's territories with their cousins and junior emperors, but they didn't want this, and mysteriously their cousins were all killed under obscure circumstances. These killings went on to include all of the brothers' male cousins, except for two who were infants. A strange familial purge of all of those were claimants to the throne, and some sources even claim that it was Constantius himself behind these acts. Well, something here. Sounds quite good. On the clock. Oh, lead. Lead. Oh, is it funky lead? Um, big bit. Or is just a big chunk? A pretty big chunk of lead. That. I mean, that's a good sign for production, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, just a nice off cut of lead there. But that was a good signal. Yeah. Nice little bit of Roman greyware there. Good sign of Roman activity. So we always like to do a little bit of field walking alongside our metal detecting because it's not just the metal objects that are important in the plough soil. And archaeologically, pottery is a treasure trove of information providing insight into many aspects of ancient life. From being a dating tool to understanding what people were eating at the time through analysis of food residue, as well as trade routes, pottery can reveal a hell of a lot. Another 17, 18, could be more lead. Quite solid though. Oh, 
What's that look? Mm. Oh. What we got? I mean, it's definitely got like a groove on here. That's definitely intentional. So there's a bit of something. Yeah. Got twisted around. Not quite sure what of though. Twisted and mangled. Twisted and mangled, most likely by the plow. One for further research, I think. Yeah. So we've got a little, little signal here. Ellie's pulled out the stubble. Just to make it a bit easier. Yeah, let's see if we can find it. There's your little number. Is it a coin? Can you see that little edge uh, lurking in there? Yeah. I hope it's a coin. It's quite thin. Yeah, very thin. Very thin. Oh, it could be a coin. Oh. I think it might be quite a large one, do you think? Yeah. Is it going to be Roman, though? Oh, is that a hole in it? Looks like it. There we go. It's looking coiny to me. Oh, yeah, it's got a hole in the middle. It's got a hole right in the middle. Oh. That's a bit odd, isn't it? I think it looks like a coin to me. I mean, the Anglo-Saxons did often hold the Roman coins to wear them. So is it a bit of a sort of a design like concentric circles going around the outside so i don't know if it's potentially part of some kind of mount or maybe like part of like a do you think that maybe potentially in the middle of a brooch or something like that it's definitely ancient and there's definitely a purpose to it that hole isn't there for no reason no exactly so further research on this curious artifact has proved rather inconclusive so we'd like to reach out to all you guys watching to leave us a comment on what you think this might be Yeah, sort of like a third, 12, 13. Not bad. What do you think we got? Is it lead? Oh, Ooh. it's very round looking lead, isn't it? We've got a token. We could, we could definitely, I think, I think so. Is there a design on it? Or is it just a plain token? It's quite, it is quite common to find plain ones. And maybe I could it count quite them. Made, yeah. After a run of ancient curios, it was nice to see the familiar shape of a lead token emerge from the soil. With one face decorated with a very faint crosshatch, this medieval lead token dates from around 1400 to 1800 AD. Tokens at this time would have been used as receipts for services or goods, or they would have also been issued in ecclesiastical contexts used to register attendance at services. This one could even have been issued to farm workers after a hard day's work and simply just lost on the land. After battling the stubble for a good hour or so, I decided to make a line for the boundary. Often when people travel across their land, they tend to stick to the edges, so boundaries can be great for lost items and relatively free of stubble too. 21, 22, is that a penny? I wouldn't be expecting that here. Oh, oh, is that the shiny? Oh, Ooh. oh, oh, what have we got in there? Hello, is that what's this little shiny new thing? Modern down there? Old... It's looking milled. Oh, oh, look at that. That's a very nice shilling. I was not expecting that in a Roman field. 1928? Oh, was it? Lovely George V on there, look. No, oh, this was the last thing I was expecting in a Roman field. So definitely not the type of silver we're expecting to come out of what is such a heavy Roman field. But with 2,000 years of occupation on this land, metal detecting tends to reveal all of it. And this lovely 1928 King George V shilling is a bit of a stunner. King George V was a highly respected and favoured king of his time, and a lot of this respect was earned during the First World War, where he made over 450 visits to troops and over 300 visits to wounded servicemen. He pressed for proper treatment of German prisoners of war and even for more humane treatment of conscientious objectors. But sadly, he was seriously ill by the end of 1928, and for the rest of his reign had to be extremely careful of his health. But this did not stop him from starting the great monarch tradition of the annual Christmas broadcast, first transmitting this in 1932. Next to the little Roman in there. 
a Roman and a shilling, you can never predict that, can you? If you're loving our digging adventures, please remember to hit that subscribe button and follow our channel. A oh, big chunky bit of grey ware here. It's a beast of a bit that. Bit of rim there. So it would have been top of quite a larger vessel. Spotting my second bit of Roman grey ware through the stubble remains, you can see why this type of pottery makes up 80% of all Roman pottery found in Britain. The Romans used grey ware for basically everything, creating vessels for food preparation, cooking, storage, and of course utensils like cups and plates. But it greatly varies across the country as it's usually produced very locally and comes in a whole range of greys. But generally, if you pick up a piece of grey coarse pottery in the field, you've got Roman in your hands. a rather alarming cloud looming in the background. Yeah, I've got some, what, 1920? Quite a signal, aren't we? Yeah. See what that is? Mm. Oh, there. What's that? Got a bit of lead. Is that lead? It's a huge bit of lead, do you think? Ooh. Oh, is it a huge? It's a huge pot mender. Oh, wow. I yeah. Think. Yeah, look, definitely. There you go. Do you see that? Massive pot mend. So that's what would have gone in the hole, and then that's what would have sealed it. Oh. So that's where they literally would have just used the lead to plug the holes in their pots. We seem to have hit a bit of a pot theme, unearthing a huge lead pot mend. These pot mends would have been created when a vessel developed a hole, so molten lead would simply be poured into it to form a plug. But I'm sure we'd all like to know, is it Roman? Well, this method of mending pottery was in use from the Roman period until the post-medieval period, and the Romans did in fact love their lead. And they didn't just use it for mending their pots. For the winemakers in the Roman Empire, nothing but lead would do, and the Roman vintners insisted on using lead pots or lead-lined copper kettles because it was thought to add complementary flavours to the wine, and to a lot of food as well. Lead actually enhanced one-fifth of the 450 recipes in the Roman Apician cookbook, but eventually, as a host of mysterious illnesses became more common, some Romans began to suspect a bit of a connection, but their habits never changed, and a lot of historians believe that many among the Roman aristocracy themselves suffered from lead poisoning. Very good little signal here. Just clear one, that one. 12, 13. Oh, let's see what we've got here, shall we? See anything? Mm, not yet. Mm, it's in that. It's in this. Ah. What is that? Oh, it's a pellet. Oh no! no! It sounded amazing. Oh, it sounds so good as well. Look. Oh yeah. Little casing. No. <laughs> Just trotting along. If you look here, it's a little fossil. I think it was mostly underwater as a county. So we get lots of these in this light. What would have been the original floor, the limestone. So during prehistoric times, Lincolnshire was covered by the sea on lots of occasions, but the most important was during the Jurassic period, around 180 to 135 million years ago. During this period, shallow seas covered much of Europe and almost all of the British Isles, including Lincolnshire, and these seas laid down sediments that over time formed limestone, shales and sandstone. As these sediments formed rock structures over time, they often trapped organisms and sea creatures within them, creating fossils much like this shell trapped in this piece of limestone limestone, probably the old seabed. Have a little 
little signal, sounds good. Yeah. Hopefully not another pellet. There. Lumper. Oh. Is it a pot leg? Well, it could be a pot leg. It does look like a pot leg, doesn't it? There is little, yeah, I reckon maybe a, a tiny, a teeny tiny pot leg of some description. <laughs> a pot mend and a pot leg. Next, we've got to find the whole pot. Yeah, that'd be cool. That would be cool. And the ancient pot finds continue. Yep, you guessed it, this strange little find is a medieval copper alloy pot leg. So from about 1100 AD, cast copper alloy vessels were commonly used for cooking, with a vessel sitting among the embers or suspended over the fire. So ancient odds and sods. <laughs> ancient odds and sods. <laughs> <laughs> Many medieval or post-medieval households would have had at least one of these vessels, and the more wealthy members of society would have actually been able to afford more than one in more than one size. But the quality of the pots themselves did not vary that greatly. Because they were valuable, they were often mentioned in wills and household inventories, and their owners generally took very good care of them, repairing holes in the body or replacing broken legs. Could the pot mend be from one of these vessels? It very well could be, because you know they love to use lead for everything. Yeah, 15. Sounds quite good. What's that, look? Little coin? That looks like a little coin to me, look. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Teeny little guy. Look how small he is. So tiny. Oh, so small, we've so got small them. Got him. So in the middle of this tiny grot, you can just about make out the standing figure of what's most likely a Roman god or goddesses. Now, from the earliest use of coinage in the Roman Empire, gods and goddesses have been used to exhibit the growing presence of their importance. The gods and goddesses were regarded as higher beings to the Roman people and served as important icons to the emperor's propaganda tactics. It's estimated that around only 20 to 30 percent of males and 10 percent of females were literate in the empire. So icons on the coin themselves were an excellent propagandic vessel for sending messages across the empire and to wherever the coins travelled indeed. Really good, 10, 11. Yeah. Look at that. Right? A teeny little bit of lead, look. It's like a little lead curl. Oh yeah. Tiny bit. Okay, I'll double check. And then I think we need to... The rain started. Throughout the dig, we've been nervously watching this dark cloud slowly approach across the horizon. And it's starting to look like we aren't going to escape it. We are much too far from the car now to make it back, so it looks like the Roman hunt's gonna have to continue in the rain. A little ten eleven. Hopefully something interesting. I think it's a Roman in the rain. Where? There. Oh, yeah. Just there, look, that little guy. Little chap. Little, oh, it's a thick one, that one. Oh, yeah. Thick lad. Thick little Roman in the rain. Is he day washing it for us, the it rain? washing it for us. <laughs> the third Roman of the day, and he's a real minim. But why is he so small? Over time, problems with inflation in the Roman monetary system caused a spike in the 3rd century of contemporary copies. These are known as Barbara's radius and is what this coin is most likely. These types can vary in both size, style and execution. Some measure only a few millimetres in diameter and are very far removed from the originals they are imitating. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Worth staying out of the road for. So this is the beginning of the end of Roman coinage in Britain, and it's the last money that the Brits will see for a while, because after the Romans leave, the monetary system dissolves away with them, and a barter system returns again to the island. It would not be until the 6th century that currency begins to circulate again in Britain. Very strong 18-19. What's it going to be? 
see anything. If you haven't noticed already, we are wearing our brand new Roman found Trash Master embroidered caps, which are available on our online store. So in true Trash Master style, here's a massive piece of plow that we thought was going to be something good. Yeah. Massive bit of plow. Glad I found that. <laughs> if you want to support our channel in the trendiest way possible, then you can grab a hat through the pinned comment below. Sixteen, seventeen. Sounds good. Where is it now? Oh, oh. What we got the. Is that lead? Looks like lead. Nothing on it. Nothing on it. It's like a funny bit of lead. Just spotted a nice bit of... What do we think that is? Is it Mortaria? I think so. Lucy had to go and grab the best pot find of the day, a shard of Roman mortaria. Mortaria were bowl-shaped vessels that were used for grinding. They were only used in Roman times and more have been found in Britain than in the rest of the empire. So they would have been used to grind herbs and spices on the coarse grit or iron slag that was embedded into the bottom of the bowl's internal surface, and they had heavy rims like this one for easy gripping and lifting. Their production was always in the hands of specialist potters who were often brought in from the continent itself and the names of these potters will sometimes be stamped onto the broad rims. With thunder brewing above and the stubble thoroughly wearing us down, it's time to head out, but if you've enjoyed all the Roman history in this episode, then be sure to check out our previous adventure looking for Romans with Rufus and Tom. And don't forget to check out our online store for all the latest Roman found drops. Thanks for watching! If you feel inspired and want to get out digging, then we've got a 10% discount code off at LP Metal Detecting, so treat yourself to some new gear. The link's in the description.